everybody. I am just going to pull this over so I can actually see myself. Hi, everybody. Um, I might start as it's 10.02 and um, I like being punctual. Um, welcome to the first of my um, five talks here with Daenerys. And thank you, Daenerys, for making this possible. It's the most fantastic um, site. And I have a, a bunch of things to plug here before we start. The first is that Jeff Sermai at one o'clock is doing backstage with Natalie Gamzo, Gamzu. And then tomorrow, Lisa and Mel are in conversation with the Bagel King, um, Michael Saffron, which should be very interesting. And then on Sunday, Ilan Kidron is, and Synchronicity um, is doing a I think it's a, a chat and performance with Leonie Cohen and a fabulous classical dancer, all of which sounds pretty amazing. Um, before I begin and start talking about uh, eman Jewish emancipation and music, I thought I should give you a little bit of a, a, an outline of who I am and my credentials for, for being um, here today. I'm a... Um, I, a clarinetist by profession, played professionally for many, many years. And um, 10 years ago, I, I looked around and I saw that there are a whole bunch of people who go to concerts, who love music, but who know very little about what they are listening to. And so I decided to rectify the situation and started a series called Coffee Cake and Culture, as you can see, where on the whole, I give music talks in my sorry my series just gone on. I'm just going to throw my phone out hold on a second sorry about that um where I give talks in my house starting with a piece of cake homemade cake and a cup of tea looking at the social political and historical concept of music putting music into its little nutshell explaining why um, music was written when it was written and as I was, have been researching this, I kept on falling over Jewish topics. And maybe because I am um, Jewish, I found these topics very interesting and have researched, done quite a bit of research on these topics. Today, we'll be looking about the emancipation, Jewish emancipation and music. Then following that, um, we'll be looking at another four topics related to the Jewish involvement in, in classical music and non-Jewish composers' interest and use of Jewish themes and ideas in their music. And as I said, today we are going to start with emancipation and music. Now, I'm starting off and I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you, do you think the Jewish people are a, a musical bunch, a musical race, musical religion, whatever you want to call us. And um, I can see that there is a lot of nodding going on. And I'm sure that you are thinking of um, a whole bunch of composers, conductors, soloists who are, are Jewish in a whole bunch of different fields, classical, um, jazz, um, popular R&B, you're probably thinking of Hollywood, you're probably thinking of movies, you're thinking of, um, of, of Broadway, all of these places where Jewish people seem to be um, at the forefront of, of musical ideas and musical activities. And you're absolutely right. In the last 200 or so years, the Jewish people really have been hitting above their weight when it comes to the world of, of music. But let's leave the last 200 odd years and let's move back to the beginning of Christianity. When we talk about the beginning of Christianity, we talk about that being the beginning of the Western tonal tradition, the beginning of, of Western music. And when the first Christians started their new religion, they needed a, a music. Almost all religions have as its core a form of music. And these new, this new religion took its musical source from two places. The first source it took its music from were, were the ancient Greeks. Music, in, they took the scales or what we call modes of the ancient Greeks um, and used that as the, the basis or the structure of their music. 
The second place they took their music from was the the Jewish people, because let's face it, the um, early Christians were converted Jews. So it made sense that the place that they, the music that they knew the best was the music of the Jewish people. And we know that cantors or the singers in, in Jewish houses of worship would sing in the Jewish houses of worship and then would go to the new Christian houses of worship and sing there. So we know that there must have been a very strong correlation between the music in both places. So from this important beginning in the world of, of music to the beginning of the 19th century, we have virtually no involvement by the Jewish people in the world of classical music, except for one man. And his name is Salomon Rossi. Now, Salomon Rossi's dates are about 1570 to 1630. He lived in Mantua in northern Italy, and he worked in the court of Vincenzo Gonzaga, who was the most important man in that part of Europe at the time. And he was working alongside the most important composer of the time, Monteverdi. And the period we're talking about is the end of the Renaissance, beginning of the Baroque period. Now, um, Salomon Rossi lived in the Jewish area or the Jewish quarter of Mantua. Every day he would come out of the Jewish area and he would go up to the palace and he would compose music alongside Monteverdi for the House of Gonzaga. The music that he composed was in no way reminiscent of the music that he was hearing within the Jewish quarter. It was typical music of the late Renaissance, early Baroque period. And so there was no Jewishness in his music. And we know that he was very well respected within the court because he was given the huge compliment, and I say that in inverted commas, of not having to wear the star, not having to wear the, the yellow star to show that he was Jewish. And this was seen as a huge badge of honor. Now, Salomon Rossi did something very interesting and, and incredibly naughty. In 1623, he wrote a collection of songs called the Songs of Solomon, where he took words from the Jewish liturgy and he put them to music. And the music he used was music typical of that late Renaissance, early Baroque period. Now you might say, so what's so terrible about that? Well, the rabbis had forbidden any new music to be written, any music besides the music of the liturgy to be written by the Jewish people from the destruction of the temple. Um, the Jewish people were in mourning and as such, no music was to be written. And so with Salomon Rossi taking the, the words of the liturgy and setting them to music, he was breaking one of the main fundamental rules or laws of the rabbis. Now we're going to listen to a little bit of it now. And what you're going to hear, it's this bizarre sound you're going to hear. Um, in one ear, you're going to hear Hebrew. It's the um, rivers of Babylon. And in the other ear, you're going to hear music that is typical, as I said, of this late Renaissance, early Baroque music. There's no sound, huh? No. No sound. No sound? Nobody can hear anything? No. Okay, let me just check and make sure everything is right here. It should be okay. Um. Okay. 
Hold on a second. I'm actually just going to uh, look what you have. I'm going to do this just to check it. So I'm going to get out of this. Sorry about this. Okay, let's hear this. Let's start again and let's make sure you hear something. Give me a thumbs up if you hear the music. the beginning of Christianity where the, those early Christians took the ideas and, and concepts of Jewish liturgical music? Did we have only one composer from that time to the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century? That was because for centuries, the Jewish people were locked away in, music, in um, Jewish areas, Jewish quarters, Jewish ghettos, whatever um, terminology you wanted to use. And they were really a nation within a nation. They had different customs, different foods, just different smells, different dress, different language, different religion, um, different religion. They were told what jobs they were and they weren't allowed to do. And they were literally locked in. They had gates that were locked every night from sunset to sunrise. And they were incredible on the whole, incredibly poor. And although they were a tiny percent of the population, they were considered a huge problem by everybody outside the, the ghettos. And they, and as such, they were excluded from, the majority were excluded from the rest of the world, except for in the musical world, Salomon Rossi. Now this began to change at the end of the 18th century and changed greatly in, a, in 1789 with the beginning of the French Revolution. At the beginning of the French Revolution, one of the things that the French did was make all minority religions religions of France. In doing so, Judaism became one of the official religions of France. Now, this didn't mean that suddenly there were no problems with the Jewish people and anti-Semitism finished or anything like that. But what it did do was it started a change within the Jewish people. And then when Napoleon came to power and decided to conquer Europe, and I have to say that 
in this talk and most of my talks, I will be talking about Western Europe rather than, than the whole of Europe. When Napoleon decided to start conquering Europe, the first thing he did when he got to every town, um, village, city, was he would go to the Jewish quarter and he would literally pull down the ghetto ga gates, freeing the Jews from bondage. Hence the fact that we call this the emancipation of Jewry. Now, don't think that Napoleon was doing this for any altruistic reason, because he wasn't. He also felt that the Jewish people were a huge problem. And he said, look, we've tried to kill them, it hasn't worked. We've tried to exile them, it hasn't worked. We've tried to um, lock them away for generations and generations, it hasn't worked. How about we try a different idea? How about we introduce them to this new fantastic world of ours, this world of the beginning of the 19th century, this world of, of um, enlightenment, this world of industrial revolution, this world of literature, of science, of technology, They're going of the arts. They're going to see this incredible new world and be so blown away by it that they're going to get rid of their archaic old ways and move into the light, move into this brand new world. And in actual fact, he was quite right because it's estimated that 100,000 Jewish people converted in, this, in, in the 19th century. And this is where we get the beginning of the reform movement because rabbis saw that there was a real problem with obviously with conversion and thought, how are we going to change our religion so that people can be straddle both worlds, can straddle the world of the secular as well as the world of the religious. Now we do it all the time. We live in a secular world and we have our religion and we are either more secular or more religious, but we, we know how to straddle this world. But this was the first time that these emancipated Jews had to come with this problem, had to decide how to deal with this problem. And this is why we had the beginning of the, the reform movement. We also see that at the beginning of the 19th century, the Jewish people, the emancipated Jewish people didn't seem to have so much problem with their Judaism. There was obviously anti-Semitism, but it wasn't, it didn't seem to be um, as overt as it was later in the century and into the next century. We also know that the Jewish people in France, as Judaism was now an official religion, didn't need to convert as much as those people living in, in the Austrian, uh, Austrian German areas where um, to, to move up this civil service, to be part of the academic world, to get work um, within the intelligentsia, you had to move, you had to convert out of Judaism. So it was a prerequisite. But what's really incredible is that right at the beginning of the 19th century, we find we, we suddenly have some of the greatest musicians and composers who happen to be Jewish, whose parents or grandparents were ghetto Jews. And suddenly we have these wonderful Jewish composers. And we're going to look at some of these composers and what we need to look at and, and be cognizant of is that when we look at these Jewish composers at the first half of the 19th century, they in no way add their Jewishness to their music. So although, as I said, their parents or grandparents could have been um, these, these, um, these ghetto Jews, they didn't put their Jewishness into their music at all. And the first composer we're going to look at is Felix Mendelssohn. Felix Mendelssohn was born in 1809 and died in 1847. He was the grandson of the philosopher Moses Mendelssohn who started the Haskalah movement, um, the movement of Jewish enlightenment, incredibly important man. His family was very notable, wealthy, but not at all religious. And in fact, in 1816, the family converted to Lutherism. 
his father said to him, look, I've looked at the philosophies of Judaism and I've looked at the philosophies of Lutherism and basically it's the same. You know, they both believe in, in honouring thy mother and honouring thy father and being good people and being good to, to other people and all those sorts of things. So, you know, it doesn't really matter whether we're Jews or Christians, it, you know, the, the basic philosophy is the same. They also changed their name from Mendelssohn to Bartholdi or Bartholdi. And you might see scores of Mendelssohn's where it says Mendelssohn, Bartholdi or Bartholdi Mendelssohn. And we can only assume that Mendelssohn didn't really have much problem with his Jewishness or his converted Jewishness because he didn't change his name. He kept his name Mendelssohn. And if you think about the name Mendelssohn, it is a very Jewish name. It's Mendel's son. You know, it's, you're not hiding your heritage when you have, especially in the, in the 19th century, the name Mendelssohn. So we can only assume that Mendelssohn was, was fine with where he stood in the world. He was a child prodigy. He wrote his first symphony at 15. He wrote the Overture to Midsummer Night's Dream at 16. He was incredibly well educated. He spoke fluent German, English, Italian, and Latin. He was a beautiful watercolorist um, and did gorgeous pencil drawings. Um, he was the darling of Queen Victoria. She thought he was pretty awesome. And he was a very conservative composer, not like the other radicals of the time, like Liszt and Wagner and Berlioz. And both he and his sister, Fanny, and I have to mention Fanny because I say that, you know, Fanny was probably more talented than Felix, but she was a woman. So that was going to be the end of her, her music career. Both of them left a huge mark on the musical world at the beginning of the Romantic period, but neither of them wrote anything that resembled a Jewishness in their music. is Giacomo Maiber. His dates are 1791 to 1864. He came from a very traditional Jewish family. Um, his father though was a financier and his mum was basically Jewish aristocracy. And the difference between Maiber and everybody else is that he was very wealthy. And when I say very wealthy, I mean uber wealthy, super, 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 super wealthy. Um, he was also a child prodigy. The great, great composer Clementi came out of retirement to teach him. He went to study um, opera in Italy and then went to Paris where he wrote um, Robert Le Diable, Robert the Devil in 1870, uh, 18, 1831, which became this overnight sensation and was really is considered the first French grand opera. He never converted, probably didn't need to convert because of his wealth. And he was seen as, I see him, I should say, I see him as being like the Andrew Lloyd Webber of the day, but with a heap more talent, because he would write one hit after another hit using all the latest technology and all the latest inventions from the industrial 
period and he would put that into his compositions and into the staging and they were all an absolute hit. Um, he also saw the scores of a, a young composer who was finding it very hard to break through the, the tight-knit world of music in, in Paris at the time, a guy called Wagner. And he read Wagner's score and he thought that Wagner really was a, a man of genius. And he introduced him to the movers and shakers of Paris and actually helped finance um, Wagner's first opera. As a thank you, um, Wagner wrote a vitriolic um, essay about how terrible Jews were and their music was and, how, and really blackguarded both Mendelssohn and Meyerbeer. And we'll talk about that more in, in future weeks. Um, and one, I think that one of the reasons why My Bear's music isn't as well recognised today as, as other composers is because of this, this um, article, this article, this um, treaty. Because when he wrote it in the late 19th century, um, My Bear's music just became completely out of fashion and never actually managed to once again get become the great music that it had in this middle period of the 19th century. It's, his music is, is charming, it's rich, it's eloquent, and it's just gorgeous. <laughs> just phenomenal um, and here we go to the next composer his name is Fromental Halevi you may not have heard of him his dates are 1799 to 1862 he was the son of a German cantor and started at the Paris Conservatoire when he was eight or nine so again just a little bit of a talent in 1865, 1835, I don't know what's wrong with my dates today, 1835, he wrote an opera called La, Jou La Jouive, the Jewess. Um, this incredibly fantastic opera, which actually the opera company, the AO, was meant to be putting on this year, and I was meant to be going to see it in the next couple of weeks. I can't believe I'm not going to be able to see it. This story is about the um, impossible love between a Jewish woman and a Christian man. And I find it fascinating that this was written in, in 1835, and obviously intermarriage was a big enough issue 35, 40 years into the concept of Jewish emancipation 
that an opera was written about it. Now, Halevi was going through this problem himself. So he was, he was discovering this problem firsthand. Um, but you don't write an opera about a topic that people don't relate to because you need to get people to go and see it. So this must have been a, an issue enough within both the Jewish community and the Christian community that Halevi felt that an opera would could be would would hit the mark um, with on this topic. Marla said about this work, I'm absolutely overwhelmed by this wonderful majestic work. I regard it as one of the greatest operas ever created. Now I've said to you that at the beginning of the 19th century, Jewish composers didn't put their Jewishness into their music. We're about to listen to this absolutely tragic aria. It's a father whose heart is breaking, a religious man whose heart is breaking because his daughter is just about to, to do the ultimate crime, convert out of her, her religion. And we can listen to this piece of music in, with two different ears. We can listen to it with the ears of a Jewish father who, and we can hear the sound of the synagogue and the breaking of the, 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 the sounds that we hear in the synagogue in the music. Or we can listen to it with the ears of a father whose heart is breaking, who, whose voice is cracking, who's so full of anguish that he can't actually function properly. And I think if we listen to it with those ears, we get a better understanding of where Halevi was trying to, to put his music, that this wasn't just Jewish music, that this is universal music. in my research and I couldn't work it out. I couldn't understand how you can have a bunch of people who are locked away, not just for a generation or two, but for hundreds and hundreds of years who are not part of society. And then suddenly they are emancipated and within a generation or two, their children are some of the greatest musicians of the day. Now, how does that work? And I know I, this is going to sound very corny and very ridiculous, but the light bulb moment came for me while I was sitting in synagogue on a Friday night. And I know that sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it's actually true. My rabbi was talking about something and I have apologized to him that I can't remember what he was talking about, but he was talking about something and he was saying, that this rabbi interprets it this way and this rabbi interprets it this way and this sage says this and this sage says this and we talked about it this way in the old days and now we think it might have meant this in the new days anyway he was talking about this and this is when this light bulb moment happened 
because it suddenly occurred to me that what these fathers were doing with their sons when they were in the ghetto for hundreds of years, they weren't kicking a football. Because if they were kicking a football, I would be sitting here talking about the prowess of Jews in sport, but I'm not. I'm talking about the prowess of Jews within the musical world. And um, what they were doing, these fathers were doing, is they were educating their sons. They were teaching them to question, to debate, to think, to, to argue, to reason. And so when the, um, the ghetto gates were, were, um, were um, broken down and the Jewish people were emancipated, these parents did exactly the same thing that they had always done. They educated their children. And they looked at this new world and they said, well, where are we going to fit into this new world? Well, they're not going to fit in in the world of the aristocrat because they're just not. And so they looked at a brand new group of people. And that group of people were the middle class. The middle class becomes incredibly important in the 19th century. The middle class are looking at the upper class and they go, how are we going to work up this social ladder? And they look at the upper classes and they go, well, the upper classes are very well educated in the world of music. They have a lot of music within their palaces. They, um, they, they um, commission lots of work. They know a lot about music. So the middle class said, the way we are going to move up this, this, um, this um, social ladder is becoming very well educated in music. The Jewish people look at the middle class and go, oh, well, they're educating their kids in music. That's what we should do too. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why we have all these great musicians is because they were, edu they were mimicking what the middle class was doing, which was educating their children in music. Now, things completely changed in the second half of the 19th century. In the musical world, um, nationalism becomes very, very important. And when I say nationalism, I don't mean the scary nationalism of the late 19th century going into the 20th century. I mean literally the need of statehood. If we think what Europe looked like, Western Europe looked like, um, Italy wasn't Italy, it was ununified, being controlled by a whole bunch of different places. Germany was about 250 little satellite states, um, all having its own ruler. Um, Hungary, Austria, I'm sorry, Hungary, Poland, the Czech areas were controlled by the German areas. Um, Belgium was controlled by Holland. And places actually wanted either unification or a national identity. And so what composers start doing in the second half of the 19th century is they start to put their nationhood into their music. They start to put um, the melodies, the feel, the, the dance rhythms, the ideas of their music into, of their, their homeland into their music. Think of composers like of Verdi, of Wagner, of um, Dvorak, of um, Liszt, of Chopin, of um, Smetana. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. It's basically everybody in the 19th, second half of the 19th century, except for Jewish composers. In the second half of the 19th century, anti-Semitism is becoming more rampant. And the Jewish people are continuously being told that although they may be from Austria, maybe Viennese, they're actually not. They can't be Austrian because they're Jewish and you can't be both. And so they are continuously being told that they are not from wherever they are from, even if they have been living in that area for generations and generations and generations. Now, how can you write music about your homeland if you are continuously being told that you actually don't come from where you, where, where you actually do come from? How can you legitimately write music about that place? And this is why in the second half of the 19th century, Jewish composers start for the first time. First, sorry, I'm just mute. First time, 
Jewish composers start writing music that is different from the music of the, the typical classical period because they can't write music that is the same. And in fact, the Jewish people were so involved in the musical world at this time. In, um, in Vienna, in Viennese conservatoires, a third of all the students were Jewish and more than half of any audience at any concert the late, late 19th, early 20th century was Jewish. And Jewish children were three times more likely to have music lessons than the rest of the community. So music was such an important part of the life of Jewish people. But Jewish composers were being told that they didn't actually belong. And the first composer we're going to look at at the second half of the 19th century is a composer by the name of Alexander Zemlinsky. Alexander Zemlinsky is the brother-in-law of Schoenberg. His dates are 1871 to 1942. His music is dark and very atypical of the music of the period. He was Jewish, he never converted. He played the organ in his local synagogue when he was a boy. He started at the Vienna Conservatoire at the age of 13, learning from Bruckner as well as others. Um, Johannes Brahms was a huge supporter of, of um, Zemlinski and his music. And in 1938, he left Vienna and went to um, New York where he really couldn't make it. He couldn't speak the language. And unlike his brother-in-law, Schoenberg, who really started another career once he came to went to America, Zemlinski floundered and, and died four years later. In Zemlinski's lifetime in Europe, he was known more as a conductor than a composer. And this was a typical lot for Jewish composers in the second half of the 19th century. Society seemed to be able to recognize a Jew as a conductor, but the title of composer was just a little bit too, too important to give to a, a Jewish man. We see this with Zemlinsky, we see this with Mahler. The piece we're going to listen to is um, a little bit from the Lyric Symphony. Now this is a phenomenal piece of music. It is so, it is deep, it is hard to listen to it at times. It is insanely beautiful. Um, the incredible conductor, Simon Rattle, Sir Simon Rattle, believes that this is a piece of music that really should now be part of the standard classical repertoire because although it may have been difficult to listen to at the time it was written, as I said, because it was so different from everything that was being written at the time, today it is totally accessible and incredibly beautiful.
next? Mahler. Gustav Mahler, whose dates are 1860 to 1911, and his music is profoundly disturbing. He converted to Catholicism um, so that he could become the director of the Vienna Opera Orchestra and then was sacked um, for trumped up charges, which were basically um, anti-Semitism, although, as I said, he converted. He understood his lot in life. He understood that even though he had converted, people were going to see him as a, a Jewish man and nothing else. And what we hear in his music is music of a man who um, knows that his, his world is like he's on quicksand, that he's not, his roots aren't stable. If you think of the music of, say, Bruchner, who was writing at exactly the same time as him, in exactly the same place, Bruchner's music is music of a man who understands his roots, understands that he's Viennese, understands that he's accepted into the musical world. We don't have that with Mahler. Mahler's music is the music of a man who is displaced, a man who in one side is saying, I know I'm Viennese, but on the other is being told continuously that he's not. It's the music of a man who sees the world as an outsider, not as somebody who is part of it. And we hear this in his music. Sometimes we hear the beauty of Vienna, the picture postcard gorgeousness of Vienna. Other times we hear the, the brutality, we hear the scariness, we hear the, um, the, the, the fear, we hear the conflict, we hear military bands, we hear insecurity, as well as all the, the, the positivity of where he lived. His music is forever changing, moving from one idea to another, like his feet aren't stable in the ground, because that's how he felt. He felt with, uh, that he had a sense of abandonment in his life and in his music. He felt, I should just also say, that he was a hum he was a humiliated outcast and the stateless European Jew. when we move into the 20th century is Schoenberg, Arnold Schoenberg. Schoenberg's dates are 1874 to 1951. Schoenberg is a composer that really terrifies most people um, and he started a second Viennese school. The first Viennese school was Mozart, Schubert, Haydn and Beethoven. And he starts a second Viennese school um, with himself and his two students, Berg and um, Webern. And they decide to write a completely new musical language. At the end of the 19th century into the 20th century, the concept of major and minor, which had been around since the time of the Baroque period, was really um, being pushed to breaking point throughout the 19th century. 
And just like in art, we had um, artists like who who wanted to paint paintings that weren't of a tree. They wanted to paint ideas and concepts. And we have Zemlinsky who paints the first non-representational piece of art. We have composer, we have Schoenberg, who decides that he doesn't want to write music that is in a major or minor key anymore. He wants to write something that is called atonal. And he's the first composer to write, to jump off the precipice and write this new music that is called at, um, atonal music. At 23, he becomes a Lutheran and he writes the famous, his famous work and Transfigured Night the following year. And although it is very dark, it is wild, widely um, accepted. Between 1916 and 1923, he writes not a piece of music because he's away trying to work out a new musical language. And in 1923, he writes a completely new musical language called Serialism. And I'm not going to go into Serialism. It's another huge talk in itself. But the whole concept of Serial... But if we had to talk about the thing that um, unified the whole of the 20th century, it was the concept of whether to use this thing called Serialism or not to use this thing called Serialism. So Schoenberg's impact on the music in the 20th century is is beyond it is it is incredibly incredibly important but in 1923 um, his friend at the time Kandinsky the, the painter wrote a letter um, which had pretty um, anti-semitic overtones in fact they weren't really overtones at all it was the letter that was pretty anti-semitic um, Schoenberg, who had converted out of Judaism, then writes all of these letters to Kandinsky, basically pulling him up on it. And he says to Kandinsky, they've tried to kill us. They've tried to exile us. There is going to be another um, Holocaust. They are going to try and get rid of us again. But once again, they're going to fail. They've tried for the last 2,000 years. They're going to try again and it's going, they're going to fail. He wrote this in 1923. In 1933, he is working um, at the Berlin Conservatoire and he is sacked because of his Judaism. And the first thing he does is he goes to um, Paris. When he's in Paris, the first thing he does is reconvert to Judaism and then goes to New York. When he gets to New York, the first thing he does is he goes to all the movers and shakers, both in the Jewish community and anyone he can meet um, and have contact with in the houses of, of um, government and the influential people in New York. And he tells them there is going to be a Holocaust, that you need to help the Jewish people because it is going to be a disaster there. And as we know, it falls on deaf ears. In 1947, he writes a piece of music called The Survivor of Warsaw. Warsaw. He writes this piece of music in 12 days. And it's like it's an outpouring of grief. He's, he has been seeing the writing on the wall since 1923. The atrocities of the Holocaust are known by 1947. And he writes this piece of music. I cannot remember everything. I must have been unconscious most of the time. I remember only the grandiose moment when they all started to sing as if prearranged. The old prayer 
we had neglected for so many years the forgotten creed. But I have no recollection how I got underground to live as a source of Warsaw for so long a time. The day began as usual. Rivoli, but it still was dark. Get out! Whether you slept or whether worries kept you awake the whole night, you had been separated from your parents, from your children. You don't know what happened to them. How could you sleep? <laughs> At first, again, get out. The sergeant will be furious. They came out. Some very slow, the old ones, the sick ones, some with nervous agility. They fear the sergeant, they hurry as much as they can, in vain. Much too much noise, much too much commotion, and not fast enough. The Feldwebel shouts, Achtung, still ihr stampen. Na, jetzt mal, oder soll ich mit dir wehrkommen nachhelfen? And if we move further into the 20th century and we look at the influence of Jewish composers and Jewish people in the 20th century, every single movement in almost every form of music, whether it's Broadway or film or all the various ideas of classical music that happened throughout the 20th century, or whether it's jazz or pop or rock and R&B and on and on and on at the forefront of almost every one of those musical movements is a Jewish person. Now, at the beginning, I asked you, are the mu Jewish people a musical bunch or a musical race or a musical whatever you wanna call us all? And we can definitely see that in the last 200 odd years, the Jewish people have been incredibly important in the world of music, but for the 2000 years or the 1800 years before that, the Jewish people had almost no connection with the musical world at all. Thank you very much. And next, I hope you um, enjoyed that. Um, I'm going to actually um, unmute you all, if I can, and ask if there are any questions. And ask if there are any questions. <laughs> Oh, maybe I'm not going to because that sounds very noisy. I'm going to mute you all again because I'm there's a lot of feedback going on. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Sorry about that. But next week, we are looking at the reverse. We are looking at how non-Jewish composers use Jewish ideas and sounds and music and an idea and... Um, biblical stories in their compositions while we have all these jewish composers who don't put their jewishness into their music we now are going to look at how non-jewish composers have been at times obsessed with jewishness in their music i hope you all enjoyed that thank, thank you very you. much for tuning in and um i will hopefully see um you next week to looking at the reverse have a wonderful time and enjoy all the wonders that denira has to offer thank you very much see you all later thank you very much indeed thank you wonderful. thank you oh hi very early for you <laughs> thank you thanks andy thanks, everybody. thank you fantastic thank you thank you thanks so much everybody Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to look at my chats. Hope there was nothing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Is, as you've on, oh no, I was going to say unmute yourself. You can mute yourself and ask me a question if you want. Unmute yourself and ask me a question if you want. That was outstanding, Andy. Oh, thank you, Bernice. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> That's a nice question. I'll take that question any day. <laughs> Thank you.
you, everybody. I will um, actually get out now. So I look forward to seeing you all next week. So thanks a lot. Have a great week.